it's the way it's packaged. It's wrapped up in this idea of of a health issue. And so if you're fat phobic, you're a good person almost. Like it's like you're you're helping the world because you're saying I'm not condoning a health issue when actually <laughs> that's such a fallacious argument. If you were to mirror that with um, if someone were to say, I don't agree with your sexuality because it's unnatural and it's a health issue, blah, blah, blah. People would go, that is awful. How could you say that? That is such a fallacious argument. You are so on the wrong page. But because somehow this narrative around fatness has come back to health, people think that it's okay to be genuinely awful human beings. For the love of God, please stop comparing being fat to being gay. Why are, why are people still doing this? Being obese is unhealthy. There's no two ways about it when you look at the data. You can tell people to be nicer to fat people, but stop comparing someone not wanting to be fat to disagreeing with being gay. It is a wildly offensive comparison to make because there are no health conditions inherent to being gay. And sure, if you want to go around hating and harassing fat people, that's fat phobic. But not wanting yourself to be fat or pointing out the health issues associated with being fat is not fat phobic. Stop trying to turn the idea of reducing obesity into an argument about eugenics. And our guest today uh, really is a leader in this space. Um, and I think the ideas that she brings to the table and the way that she frames it and the empathy as well and kindness that she shares is so important when you're having these conversations. So let's get into it. And would you mind giving a definition of fat phobia? Yeah, I mean, fat phobia is, it's a form of bigotry or discrimination that says that fat people are morally, physically, and also have naturally, automatically have poor health. So that's what fat phobia is. Straight out the gate, Virgie saying some stuff. The wording she used in this clip is kind of clever. She said, part of fat phobia is the idea that fat people have, quote, natural or automatically poor health. I don't think fat people automatically have poorer health than any random thin person, but they do naturally have more health problems than the average skinny person. So I don't know if she did that on purpose with this wording, but she got around outright saying that being fat has no bad health implications without actually saying it. And how does diet culture fit into that? I mean, diet culture could not exist without fat phobia. Um, people just wouldn't diet if there wasn't a fear of being fat. People are afraid of being fat because our culture treats fat people horribly. It took me a long time to unpack this. And so I think for a lot of people, they don't understand, right? Like when they say, I want to lose weight, what they're actually saying is, I want to be loved. I want to be respected. No, just no. I hate this sentiment. Not only because this argument undermines the very real health problems someone could potentially face being fat that could cause them to want to lose weight, but she's also telling you that when you hear someone tell you that they want to lose weight, the first thing you should hear is that this person hates themselves and feels disrespected. This mentality of anyone who wants to lose weight just has low self-esteem is a way of automatically ignoring and discrediting anyone whose reasons for losing weight differ from I hate myself. Not only is this inaccurate to a lot of the reasons people may want to lose weight, but it is highly disrespectful to assume anyone's reasoning and motivation before they even get a chance to explain it. Or to just ignore the reasoning they give you and proceed to tell them why they actually want to lose weight. I want to be able to find clothes I like. I want people to take me seriously as a romantic partner. I don't want to get discriminated against at the doctor. When people diet, it's typically about that. It's about running away as far as you can from being someone who is treated poorly because of fat phobia. The phrase diet culture, especially the word culture, really speaks to the fact that it's inescapable. Like it's everywhere. Again, she's telling people to assume that it is almost always external factors that cause someone to want to lose weight, which is rude. And I know this may seem like a nitpicky criticism, but I've said this before, 
Virgie is a terrible communicator, and she doesn't seem to understand how to put together a coherent thought or idea. She said the term that culture is in diet culture, which means that diet culture is everywhere because it has the word culture in it. But that doesn't mean that it, something is common just because it has the word culture in it. Some cities have a big motorcycle culture, but that doesn't mean motorcycle culture is everywhere. Or some places have a lot of indigenous culture, but that doesn't mean indigenous culture is everywhere. I know this is a small quibble to make, but Virgie does this so often where she'll just say something random and nonsensical just out of nowhere. And I think she does it because she runs out of things to say. So she just pulls a buzzword out of somewhere like diet culture just to like say something. But I cannot put into words how much I can't stand when she does this. What are some of the harmful ways that fat phobia manifests itself? The medical field has some of the highest rates of bias against higher weight people of any industry or field, which is really troubling. And, and what that really looks like is a number of really startling things. First of all, higher weight people get screened for cancer less frequently. Higher weight people are more likely to walk away from a doctor's appointment with essentially a prescription for dieting instead of getting their actual symptoms treated. Higher weight people are more likely to delay care because they're afraid of getting weighed or shamed at the doctor. And this leads to overall poorer health. I do think there's some validity in what she's saying. I do think doctors can be too dismissive of some people's problems when it comes to fat patients and it can manifest in worth health for some people. With that being said, I don't think the medical profession has more bias towards fat people than the rest of the world. I just think the outcomes of these biases, along with the fact that doctors are more aware than any lay person of how harmful obesity can be on the body, makes it seem like health professionals are somehow more biased against fat people. But I will also say that the argument that being fat has no effect on health, like the fat acceptance movement likes to claim, is completely contradictory with the scientific evidence that all medical professionals are taught. So denying the health effects of obesity is just going to continue to put fat people directly at odds with the healthcare professionals that are tasked with taking care of them, which is a main talking point of fat acceptance. They want better healthcare, but they keep spreading misinformation when it comes to healthcare. Another way that it really shows up is the wage gap. And at least in the United States, plus size women get paid anywhere between $9,000 and $19,000 less per year than their straight size counterparts. And I think, you know, beyond that, there's a lot of data ensconced within that finding that is really startling too. Like, for example, the fact that um, in general, plus size people get funneled and pushed into more physically laborious caretaking jobs. And thin people are often funneled to more client facing, higher paying jobs. When you think about just like companies and optics and who they want to quote unquote represent them, there's favorable hiring happening for smaller people. Um, this is not some tiny minority. This is the majority of more and more Western populations. And so I just kind of think it's really staggering to me, um, like, how this hierarchy is created. I don't know the exact research Virgie is referring to when she claims that fat people get paid less than thinner people, but I believe that it's most likely true. The thing is, being fat pushes you out of what is considered conventionally attractive, and people that are more conventionally attractive are going to do better in life. People are just going to be nicer to you, you'll have just an easier time living if you're conventionally attractive. It's unfortunate, but true. But even though being pretty does give you an advantage, this kind of hierarchy that Virgie just mentioned with thinner people at the top and fat people at the bottom exists with all physical attributes that could make someone conventionally unattractive. Having facial scars, loose skin, visible skin conditions like acne, being a certain height, having any sort of physical deformity, just having any of these things doesn't necessarily mean you have less privilege in a systematic sense, but it does affect how you interact with the world. And this is why the fat acceptance movement's co-opting of body positivity as their own really frustrates me. Because if you're going to see fat versus thin as some sort of hierarchical struggle, you should be able to acknowledge that same struggle within other people that have facial scarring, deformities, etc. What I'm saying is that despite what she's saying probably being true, that fat people are paid less, 
it's no more of a systematic struggle than countless other physical attributes that the body positivity movement actively claims are less oppressive than being fat. Regardless of if I feel like this is a major problem, I think if you're going to complain about this struggle, at least don't invalidate other people with the same struggle in the process. And that's why these types of claims made by people like Virgie mean very little to me because of how hollow this type of selfish activism is. Really based on a very small number of people, when we think about the moments that are really important to society, like marriage, graduation from college or secondary school, celebrating things, right? Like plus size fashion is almost completely inaccessible. It's very difficult to find like a tuxedo beyond the very, very limited um, straight size run. Very difficult to find a wedding dress. Very difficult to find like in the United States, there's like prom is like one of the biggest things, right? Like, you know, it's very difficult to find a prom dress if you're plus size. And it sort of sends this message of like who gets to have those moments. No, it doesn't. That That's not the message. That's the message you interpreted it as. Not being able to find certain styles of clothing is unfortunate, but not producing dresses or clothing in a certain size could just mean that it's not profitable for a business to do that, or there's not a big enough market of fat women that want tuxedos to make them. It's quite a leap to take a simple lack of diverse clothing options to, this is a sign the world doesn't want me to exist. Clothes are not the end-all be-all of someone's worth. There's a lot more, like obviously um, higher weight people experience weight discrimination in the dating world. Um, there's evidence even that fat people, higher weight people experience discrimination even when it comes to making friends, you know? And then not to mention the fact that like once, you know, let's say in the workplace, once you do get hired, you're probably gonna be in a work environment where there's ubiquitous diet and weight loss talk which is essentially yet another sign that you're not welcome as you are and that you should definitely change, which is a very stressful message to be receiving every day in addition to all the other stressors at work create, you know? Oh, wow. She just did the signature Virgie move of jumping from one topic to another without actually explaining or connecting anything. Ugh. She said that fat people may have trouble dating or making friends, there's a lot I could say about both of these topics, but because she literally gave no details on either one, I'm not going to debate it. But the whole diet talk at work thing, first of all, she did that thing where she jumped to a wild conclusion from something very simple. People talking about dieting in your general vicinity doesn't mean that the world doesn't want you to exist. And second, considering you are the same woman that made an entire video being mad about someone asking for a smaller slice of cake, it's more accurate to say that you don't want people that are dieting to exist. If you feel like you should be able to talk about your size and all the foods you love eating all the time, including in professional settings, then other people should be able to discuss dieting in those same settings. Yeah, oh, I think that's a really good way to put it, is like not feeling like you have a right to joy. And, and I mean, honestly, it's not like we're taught that. That's not something that we were born believing. I mean, I think I immediately thought about food and all the food that I missed out on. I, I remember I wrote this essay a long time ago that was about like the food cemetery in my mind and how I can see all of the beautiful, delicious celebratory meals, like they're etched into the headstones in the cemetery because I remember them like so vividly and what it was like to be like, I don't deserve to have this. Someday I will be able to have this when I am thin, you know. Something very interesting about this segment is that when Virgie was asked what joy she's missed out on in life, her immediate response was food. She missed out on a lot of food. She has mental gravestones of the meals she didn't have. It's okay for food to give us a little bit of pleasure but when I think about the things I've missed out on in life that would have made me happier and made my life more fulfilling, food would be very far from the top of the list. And I think for most other people as well. I think this goes to show how integral food is in Virgie's life and her borderline obsessive behavior when it comes to thinking about it. That and the fact that she has a podcast called The Rebel Eaters Club. I feel like dieting is like a death practice. You know, it kills your spirit. 
it certainly destroys your mental health. It's certainly, for a lot of people, it threatens their physical health. It takes joy out of everything. And, and I think that future self, like when I stopped seeing my future self as a thin person and started seeing my future self as a fat person, it, there was just like so much joy in it. It was so scary at first, but now it's like, it just feels so intuitive. I can just imagine like my, like, you know, my tummy looking the same, my double chin and my cheeks. And like, as I'm 40 and as I'm 50 and as I'm 60 and as I'm 70, First of all, I just want to say that the podcast kind of just cuts her off at this point. She went on this long rant and the editor was just like, yeah, that that's enough of that <laughs> because she just rambles so much. But I think what Virgie just said summarizes the fat acceptance movement so well in that one, she sees dieting as this depressing, soul-sucking task that takes the joy out of everything in life. And two, She's convinced herself that ignoring her bad relationship with food and embracing her size is the key to true happiness. I've said before, the fat acceptance movement convinces women that dieting is useless and happiness comes from blissful ignorance about their size. And Virgie just confirmed that. Scientific evidence be damned, she's happier not thinking about how her diet affects her health. But when it comes to obesity, that ignorance will come back to bite most people in the end. So I really wanted to talk to you more about this idea of preoccupation with your future self. It honestly, her answer was really meaningful to me and it also made me really sad, I have to admit, because the cruelness that comes from sidelining yourself from joy or always visualising a future where you're you know, your hopes and dreams are contingent on this idea of you being in a thinner body. It just, it feels so mean. It feels so nasty. And I definitely do that to myself all the time. You know, when I have my little daydreams about future moments, I, in most of those daydreams, I am in a thin body. Absolutely. Like my body has changed. I'm thin and, and, you know, I'm happy in those moments too. Earlier in the episode, Virgie talked about how fat women often sideline themselves from certain things in life because they don't like how they look. And that's what the speaker is referring to in this clip. But I want to point out that fat people aren't the only people doing this. I said earlier that there are societal struggles that are similar among anyone who isn't considered pretty. So this type of preoccupation with how you look can be applied to anyone that isn't considered conventionally attractive. I know people that have bad skin conditions that may be hesitant to go on outings with friends if they think their picture is going to be taken, or friends with intense scarring on their legs that don't like going to the beach for a fear of being judged. I just want to point out that if people are going to discuss this type of struggle when it comes to being fat, they should be just as open to discussing these same problems when it comes to other unconventionally attractive features. And this is even more confirmation about the fact that the body positivity movement should be for everyone, because most people have some attribute that wouldn't be considered conventionally attractive. These conversations are so important for me as someone who's learning about fat phobia and my place in the structures of oppression, because I know that willing or unwilling, I probably have contributed how I navigate as a better ally and it's been really difficult to pinpoint that because in order to be a better ally <laughs> you need to notice and for some reason fat phobia is one of those things that that you almost don't even see it maybe the reason you don't notice it is because the system of oppression you're referring to doesn't exist and I don't think listening to fat people tell their stories is inherently bad but this idea that fat phobia is systemic and that I need to be a thin ally can lead a lot of people to try to find systemic struggles in fat phobia where there really aren't any. This entire clip was her essentially saying, I want to be a thin ally and fight fat oppression, but I struggle to see where the oppression is. Yeah, I wonder why. I kind of want to issue a challenge to anyone who listens and thinks that they don't have fat phobia bias to to just sort of take a second if you ever see a fat person out about and think to yourself, am I thinking of this person as a fat person or am I thinking as this person as a human being? Am I thinking of this person as a fat person or am I thinking of this person as a human being? That is quite a statement and I could go 
deep into breaking down all of the implications of this very interesting statement. But since she asked, I'll answer and say, I don't register other people in my general vicinity enough to care. Fat or otherwise. I really don't care. And I'm sure I'll get at least one comment raving about how I'm taking the colorblind approach and that you're denying their identity by ignoring that people are fat. Shut up. Just shut up. I would issue the same call to action for anyone who has never experienced um, the shame that comes with going into a store and them not having your size. So if, if you fit into straight size clothing and you are not reckoning with fat phobia, then you're not doing enough. Oh my God, this point. If you haven't watched my video on fat acceptance and insecurity, I would recommend going to watch that. But in that video, I mentioned how so many fat activists use the point that clothing stores not having their size and the shame that comes with it is part of the systematic struggle of being fat, but it isn't. If you were ashamed of your size and having to shop in a separate clothing section than thin people, that is a personal problem. I have many plus size friends and family members that have no shame in shopping at Torrid or Lane Bryan. So why do skinny people need to reckon with your shame in order to support fat women? You are insecure, honey, and you need to deal with it. It makes you a better person in general and it makes you feel it makes you feel better with your body in general if you unlearn fat phobia. Like as a straight sized person, like if you do the work to unlearn it and to to understand like the harm that you may have caused by that bias as well. Like that, again, it opens doors for you to kind of like step out of this diet culture mindset to move into a place where like you're exercising for yourself, you're eating for yourself. Like I cannot stress enough how <laughs> beneficial it is for everyone to just be decent and do the work. Saying that unlearning your fat phobia will free you up to finally work out and eat for yourself suggests that people who are fat phobic must not work out and eat for themselves. But I would definitely say that's not true. And I don't know exactly what definition of fat phobia they're using, whether it's being afraid of being fat or being unkind to fat people. But in either case, I would argue that someone can still have a perfectly healthy relationship with food and exercise and still be fat phobic. Now, I'm not saying if you hate fat people, you shouldn't work on that, but the idea that not wanting to be fat or disliking fat people simply means that you are sucked into diet culture is a wildly simplistic view of fat phobia. And it connects back well to what Virgie said earlier in the episode, that if someone wants to lose weight, that you obviously hate yourself. Because in the minds of these people, of these fat activists, their mentality is that if you are fat and you want to lose weight, it's because of diet culture. And if you are thin and you don't want to gain weight, it's because of diet culture. That's the only factor that registers for them. Never mind the health implications of being fat or the, that people can just be mean sometimes. It all goes back to diet culture. And this also goes back to things like eating disorders and body dysmorphia, which I've made videos on if you haven't watched them, and how fat activists often talk about how those problems are rooted in diet culture and fat phobia as well. For them, diet culture leads to fat phobia, which leads to eating disorders. Or diet culture leads to self-hate, leads to wanting to lose weight, leading to body dysmorphia. Or diet culture leads to a fear of being fat, which leads to fat phobia. It's all a very simplistic view of a lot of complicated problems. But to them, diet culture is just the root of all evil, and that's why they focus on it so much. You briefly mentioned on access to health care and doctors, and I'm aware that when you talk about fat phobia, you can't escape from the health argument that's like one of the first things a lot of people will say when you're arguing it with them and i'm just wondering i still am kind of at a loss for how to respond to that effectively i think i need to equip myself with a bit more knowledge around it and some facts so how do you navigate that question 
But I definitely see it, for the most part, I do see it as a derailing mechanism. I don't see it as a source of genuine curiosity uh, or, or born of genuine curiosity. Um, because at the end of the day, what I've just told you about the reality of fallout of fat phobia, I have a very difficult time understanding uh, as someone who lectures about this, talks about this all the time. If I were to spend an hour talking to you about all the things I just shared with you about what it's like being a fat person, the fact that your first question is, but what about health strikes me as exceedingly callous, exceedingly sort of dehumanizing. I'm like, I've just told you the horrible reality that higher weight people face on every front from like clothing to jobs to healthcare to access to romantic relationships or meaningful cultural moments. And your first thought is, does this person even deserve to have those? That, that's what I hear. What Virgie hears when someone asks about the health implications of being fat is that this person is questioning if she deserves to have a happy life. Girl, that sounds like something you need to work out in therapy. But regardless, I find it interesting that she said the health question comes up a lot when she gives speeches and that she finds this to be a problem. Because I actually think it's a very reasonable question for someone to ask when talking about fatness in society. Especially if you're speaking in an academic institution or to people that aren't educated on the subject. Of course people are going to bring up health first when we hear about the obesity epidemic all the time. I'm more surprised that you find the question surprising. Virgie takes offense to this question because she feels like asking about health immediately after giving her personal anecdotes on what it's like to be fat is invalidating her experiences. But the people in the audience aren't there to validate your feelings. It's one thing to talk about your problems to a friend and to have them quickly turn around and ask about health instead of validating your struggles, but you're giving a speech to strangers. They're presumably there to learn, not give you reassurances. So of course they're going to ask, what about health? Societal factors comprise 70% of our overall health. Only 30% of our overall health is determined by individual factors. So um, I think it's important to say, right, like if most of a person's health is determined by whether or not their society is treating them fairly, giving them medical care, making sure that they don't have, they don't experience discrimination, right? Then why in the world are we asking individual people to lose weight to change a number that's that big? Like I often ask, I'm like, whenever I talk about this and I put the slide up of the pie chart, I'm like, if societal factors comprise more than double individual factors, why aren't we as enthusiastic and stoked about changing, moving that needle as we are about telling people to eat salad? I mean, I think when you just think about it from a logical perspective, it doesn't make any sense. I don't know the validity of this 70-30 figure she just gave, but assuming she's correct, there's a few things I want to say. One, she didn't actually answer the question, what about health? <laughs> She kind of just skirted around it by saying only 30% of our health was in our control, but she didn't actually say that being fat is healthy or unhealthy. Her response to the health question was basically, we can't control our health anyway, so why does it matter? And even if only 30% of our health is within our control, it still makes sense that we would encourage people to make individual changes for themselves. 30% is a large percentage. If you were told 70% of your risk for colon cancer was out of your control, but 30% of it was within your control, most people wouldn't be like, well, I guess there's nothing I can do about it. Might as well do nothing. No, you do what you can that's within your control. Yes, you can try to change society, but you have much, much more control over the decisions you make in your life. I can choose to eat healthier and exercise today. I can't change society today. So why would you not take advantage of that when it comes to something as important as your own health? And then the final thing that I kind of want to share, right? Data aside, there are so many things that we can do to improve um, anyone's health. Like right now, you know, like if you ask me as a fat person, how can I improve your health? I, you know, it could be like 
could you treat me like a person? Could you offer me a cup of tea? Could you meditate with me? Could you go on a walk with me? Could you introduce me to your family? Could you treat me like uh, like an equal, right? Could you um, make sure that when we go out to eat lunch that there's a seat that I can comfortably sit in? Um, when your coworker makes fun of me, can you stand up for me? Um, you know, like I can give you a li- I can keep going. I could have a thousand things. Um, there are so many things that we can do to promote health. Um, and fat phobia is nowhere on that list. When asked how people can support her health as a fat person, she said that you can meditate with her, offer her a cup of tea, and introduce her to your family? What? I really don't know what to say about that. That is super weird. You can't meditate and make tea on your own? Are you lonely? Is that why you want to meet people's families? Because if that's the case, this is more than just a fat person problem. I don't understand how any of these ways are ways that people can systemically support fat people. (laughs) It's such a weird statement. Just, Virgie, why? You have this beautiful campaign, Lose Hate Not Wait, Um, And I'm wondering how, do you have any beginning steps of how to do that? Like any prompts or things to think about? You kind of spoke about visualization a bit. Has that been a tool in that journey for you? Yeah, that's been a tool. I mean, I think, you know, to begin with, right, start thinking about not restricting food. I mean, that's, that's sort of the first step is like stop believing that you can live your whole life like this and you deserve to live your whole life like this. Pretty much no one enjoys restricting food and dieting. Um, So, you know, what would it look like to believe that you actually matter, that your joy matters, that, you know, that you deserve good things? I think, like, that's a really powerful starting point, right? And I think, you know, starting with, for me, the path really began with I'm not restricting food anymore. That was probably the most powerful decision I've possibly ever made in my life you know i think what's great is once you stop restricting food you immediately are beginning the work of recuperating your intuition this is the information highway that your body is constantly giving you information and what dieting among other things what that does is that it shuts down that information it shuts down that highway because the highway is telling you don't starve me. I want to eat. I want to eat till I'm full. I want to eat what I want. Do not starve me. That's what that's telling you. So you have to be shutting that voice down every day that you're dieting. So once you stop doing that, then you start, you open up the highway again and it starts to tell you stuff. For a quick second, I want to discuss the phrase, lose hate, not weight. Because it seems like a pretty harmless phrase on its own, but the underlying implication is that losing weight is in and of itself, kind of hateful. Which is obviously untrue, so I'm obviously not a fan of this phrase. And Virgie goes on to explain how you can become less hateful, and this includes not restricting food. Which again implies that the simple act of restricting food is hateful. Hate that is directed at yourself and possibly others. And I don't think I have to explain why that isn't true. But this type of thinking of lose hate, not weight, and seeing restricting as a hateful act can help explain why there's so many fat activists and people that follow fat acceptance that are now saying things like restrictive EDs are fat phobic. Virgie then goes on to say that nobody enjoys restricting because she believes that you are essentially depriving yourself of joy and happiness, but there's a few things I want to say about that. One, even if you believe that nobody enjoys restricting, that doesn't make it inherently bad. There are many things we do as adult humans that we do to remain healthy that we don't enjoy. Paying our bills, brushing our teeth, going to the doctor regularly. None of these are things people enjoy really, but we do them to maintain our physical, financial, and emotional health in the long term. And two, she says that when we stop restricting, we are finally listening to our bodies. But that ignores the fact that there are many conditions that override our body's ability to regulate what and how much food we need, including binge eating and food addiction. And for me personally, like, as with so many people, 
this was the case when we were all locked down and in quarantine, you know, I gained weight. That was what my body needed at the time. It was, it needed to feel comfort. It needed food. It needed nourishment. I was stressed, like all of those things and the patterns of behavior that so many other people around the world experienced. And I think it was one of the first times in my life that that didn't completely derail me. Like the gaining weight didn't completely like take me out of every single moment in my life and back to like this mindset of like restricting and like punishing so that that's been a really positive step is just being like you know acknowledging in myself okay I don't feel great about this but I'm not going to punish myself or restrict because of it I'm just gonna acknowledge that it's probably what my body needed this sentiment of finally not being ashamed of gaining weight on its own is fine people don't gain anything from being shamed especially when it comes to coping with stressful life events. But with that being said, you also don't have to rationalize your own unhealthy behavior by saying that your body needed nourishment so it was fine. You can just say, I coped with this stressful time in an unhealthy way and I don't need to be ashamed of that. But you can also try to correct the unhealthy behavior. The problem is that these women don't see overeating as a problem. Ever. But it certainly can be. One thing that I've been doing recently, which I love, I get so much inspiration and so much body acceptance practice from being in nature because there is no part of your body, no matter how much you don't like it, that isn't out there in nature, just living its best life unapologetically. So what I, what I did like a couple weeks ago, I posted this on Instagram, but I took a picture of my inner thigh, which has scarring from chub rub and has little rolls from my fatness and like has my hair hair follicles are kind of different on my inner thigh and I just went out in nature and looked for um, plants and trees and things that were in nature that looked like my inner thigh and it was so easy to find like I found this cactus that had the same hair follicle vibe as I did and I found this tree that had like all these little lumps that look like fat rolls nature mirrors us because we are nature I think that's where I'm at now in my process that's so beautiful. No, it isn't. It, that's not beautiful. That's weird. That's one of the weirdest things I've ever heard. And I, it, it, just the way she said that made me so uncomfortable. I don't... <laughs> why would you say something like that? I think she triggered my fight or flight response with just how strange that was. Oh my god. Now I feel like I need to fight a cactus. To the death. Oh, I need to go for a walk. And I'm back. Thank you for watching. That's the end of the episode. I hope you guys liked it. If you did, please like the video. I'm sufficiently weirded out having to have listened to this entire thing, but I hope y'all at least found it interesting, and I'll see you in the next video.